Beelzebub's Tales to His Grandson, Chapter 40 Beelzebub tells how people learned and again forgot about the fundamental cosmic law of Heptaparapashanach. After Beelzebub had listened to what was communicated in the Laito Chandros, handed to him, his grandson Hassein again turned to him and said, My dear and kind grandfather, please help me to clear up for myself one contradiction which I do not understand and which does not accord with my logical confrontations. When you began your elucidations about the holy planet Purgatory, you enjoined me to try to take in everything you spoke about without missing anything. And you also enjoined me constantly to maintain the intensive tension of my active mentation, so that corresponding data for the formation of the notion relating to every question explaining the details of both primordial, fundamental, sacred cosmic laws should be completely crystallized in me. I did indeed try during all your elucidations to do so, and it seems to me I cleared up so much for myself about these cosmic laws that I could perhaps even freely explain them to someone else. In any case, I can already very well represent to myself the sacred law of Triamazikamno with the particularities of all three of its sacred independent forces and cognize it for my personal essence quite satisfactorily. But as regards the sacred law of Heptaparapashanoch, then, although I have not yet fully cleared up to my reason certain of its, in my opinion, unimportant details, nevertheless I hope that with a little more active pondering I shall understand them as well. Now, however, after I had, while trying to assimilate well these sacred laws, clearly sensed and I became aware that they are very complicated and in general very difficult for a complete understanding. It suddenly greatly astonished me and continues to astonish and interest me how the three-brained beings who arise and exist on the planet Earth could not only understand these sacred cosmic laws but could even have constated them among the surrounding cosmic results because from all your tales about them, I got the full impression that since the second Transapalnian perturbation there, when each of the newly arising results of theirs becomes a responsible being, he becomes, thanks to the abnormal prevailing Oskiano, the possessor of only automatic reason, and that it is impossible to understand both of these sacred cosmic laws with such a reason. I became convinced with the whole of my essence when I myself tried to understand them. Having said this, Hussein looked questioningly and eagerly at his beloved grandfather. Having thought a little, Beelzebub began to speak as follows. All right, my dear boy, I shall try to elucidate to you also about this natural perplexity which justly arises within you. It seems to me, I already once told you that although from the period you mentioned on that planet almost all the three-brained beings there became, thanks to the abnormally established conditions of ordinary being existence, possessors of only an automatic reason. Nevertheless, it does sometimes happen there that certain of them, by chance, escape this common fate, and that instead of that automatic reason which has become usual there, a genuine objective being reason is formed in certain of them, as it is in all three centered beings of our great megalocosmos. Although such exceptions especially during recent centuries, are very rare there, yet, I repeat, they nevertheless do occur. 
in order that you may approximately represent to yourself and understand just how such exceptions may occur among them. You must first of all know that in spite of the fact that from the time when all the consequences of the properties of the organ Kundabuffer began to be crystallized in them, it became proper to them to have automatic reason during their responsible existence. Yet, nevertheless, always and up to the present time, at the arising and the beginning of the formation of each one of them, there is always in their presence the germ of all possibilities for the crystallization, during their completing formation into responsible beings, of corresponding being data, which later, during responsible existence, could serve for the engendering and functioning of objective reason, which should be in the common presences of three-brained beings of all natures and of all external forms, and which in itself is nothing else but, so to say, the representative of the very essence of divinity. There, in the objective sense, extreme misfortune about that which you yourself already perplexedly instinctively suspect, as I discern from the formulation of your question, especially from your having mentioned Oskiano, consists just in this, that they, having indeed at their arising such possibilities in themselves, immediately fall from the very first days after the separation from their mother's womb, only thanks to the abnormalities established in the process of ordinary being existence of beings around them who have already reached responsible age, under the stubborn influence of that maleficent means invented by them themselves for themselves, which, as I already told you, represents in itself a something of the kind of Oskiano which they call education. And in consequence, in this way, all possibilities for the free formation of all that which is required for the engendering of objective being reason is gradually atrophied and finally disappears in these unfortunate, so to say, still innocent in everything newly arising beings during the period of their what is called preparatory age. And as a result, when these newly arising beings later became responsible beings, they, in their, so to say, essence center of gravity, become the possessors not of that objective reason which they ought to have, but of that strange totality of automatically perceived artificial, even deceptive impressions, which, having nothing in common with the localization of their spiritualized being parts, nevertheless acquires a connection with the separate functionings of their common presence. In consequence of this, not only the whole process of their existence flows automatically, but also almost the whole process of the functioning of their planetary body becomes dependent only on chance, automatically perceived external impressions. In very rare cases, certain of these favorites of yours who have reached responsible age become possessors of genuine pure reason, proper to three-brained responsible beings. This usually proceeds there thus. For instance, it happens that immediately after the separation from his mother's womb, one of the newly arising beings finds himself for the process of his subsequent formation among such surrounding conditions, where for some reason or other all kinds of those abnormalities with which the entire process of the external being existence of three-brained beings breeding on this ill-fated planet, is already overfilled. Do not touch him, and do not influence him automatically, maleficently. And in consequence of this, the germs which are in him for the possibilities of acquiring pure reason have not the time, during the process of his subsequent formation, to become atrophied to the very root. 
And further, it sometimes also happens that for the subsequent completing formation of such a three-brained being there, newly arisen in the said relatively normal conditions, his responsible guide during his preparatory age for responsible existence is such a three-brained being as had before this, also, of course, by chance, already been completely formed in the same way, and in the functioning of whose waking consciousness, thanks to the frequent actualization in his presence of being partic dog duty, there had participated the data which had remained whole in his subconscious for the engendering of the divine impulse of conscience. And so, this same guide, being aware with the whole of his being of the important significance of his responsibility taken upon himself in relation to this new being, who has, in the said manner, only as yet reached his preparatory age, begins, according to conscience, impartially to create for his Oskiano every kind of what are called inner and outer factors for the perceiving of corresponding impressions in order to crystallize in his common presence all those data, the totality of which alone can give to the three-brained being who has reached responsible age the power to be Svoli Brunolnian, or as your favorites there on earth would say, the potency not to be identified with and not to be affected by externals through one's inevitable inherent passions. And this being impulse engendered in the being with these data can alone help him to acquire the possibility of a free and impartial constatation of all true phenomenon appearing in the cosmic results around him. Here it is very opportune to repeat once again that on most planets of our megalocosmos, on which three-brained beings arise and exist, there is an oft-repeated sentence formulated in the following words, Our common father endlessness is only the maker of a three-centered being. The genuine creator, however, of his essence during the period of his preparatory existence is his Oskianotsner, namely he whom your favorites call tutor or teacher. And so, even during the last century, it occasionally happened there that such a one from among your favorites who had already reached responsible age completely formed and prepared in the said manner for external perceptions, constating by chance a certain law-conformable particularity among the cosmic results around him, began to study it in detail and from every aspect, and having ultimately attained, after long persevering labors, to some objective truth or other, initiated other beings around him and similar to him into this truth. Now, my boy, listen to how these peculiar three-brained beings first became aware of this fundamental cosmic law of the sacred Heptaparapashanoch, and how the totality arose there of all the information concerning its various details thoroughly cognized by previous beings, and which had become after having been transmitted from generation to generation, the possession of every subsequent three-brained being of this planet of yours, which could enable them to cognize this information also. And likewise, listen to what and when, thanks to always the same strangeness of their psyche, there resulted from all this. I wish to explain to you about this in even as great detail as possible, with all the sequence of the historical course of development, both as regards the constatation of the cognizance concerning the sacred law, as well as the gradual forgetting about it, because such information relating to all this will greatly help you. 
first of all, to elucidate those, as you express it, unimportant details of this sacred law, which you have not yet completely transubstantiated in your reason. And secondly, thanks to these elucidations of mine, you will likewise learn that among the number of your favorites, even the contemporary ones, such responsible beings do occasionally appear in the sphere of genuine learned beings. And assuming that the other three-brained beings there existed more or less normally, then, thanks to the impartial and modest conscious efforts of these beings, genuine objective learning might arise and gradually develop also on this ill-fated planet as a result of which that welfare might be obtained also for them, which the three-brained beings of all the other planets of our great megalocosmos have long ago deservedly enjoyed. In the beginning, during the period when the three-brained beings of that planet had in themselves the organ Kundabuffer, it was of course out of the question that the beings of the Earth could have learned about any cosmic truths. But afterwards, when the functioning of this maleficent organ which they had in their presences was destroyed, and when, in consequence, their psyche became free and became, so to say, their own and individual, it was just from then on that all kinds of stories began concerning their relatively sane being mentation. The perceiving and cognizing of the fundamental cosmic law of the sacred Heptapara Parshanoch by the common presences of these three-brained beings who have taken your fancy began for the first time on the continent Atlantis at that period when, do you remember, I already told you, certain beings there understood by themselves that something not quite right proceeded in them? and when they themselves discovered that they had certain possibilities of being able to destroy this something not quite right, and of becoming such as they ought to be. It was just at that period of the flow of time when certain of them began to observe those, according to sane being mentation, abnormal functionings which proceeded in their common presences and to search out the causes of these abnormalities, and to try to find every kind of possibility for removing them from themselves. And when many branches of real science there had reached a high degree of development, that among the number of those who were seriously interested in this, as it was then called, most necessary functioning of reason, there was that terrestrial three-brained being by the name Theophany, who was the first to lay a rational foundation for the subsequent development of this branch of genuine science. As I later chanced to learn, this same theophany was once pouring a certain mixture onto a marble slab to dry, consisting of the extract of the plant then called patatuk, pine resin, and cream of the milk of the then famous what were called Genionian goats, so that after its hardening, a mastic should be obtained, used for chewing after eating, when for the first time he noticed that in whatever way and in whatever quantity this mixture was poured onto that marble slab, it always, concentrating in the same way, assumed after the final cooling a form composed of seven definite plane surfaces. This fact, unexpectedly constated by this theophany, greatly astonished him, and the intensive wish arose in his common presence to elucidate to his reason the radical causes of this law conformableness still unknown to him. And therefore, from that time on, he began to repeat the same thing but already with a conscious aim. Shortly after, still at the beginning of the investigations which Theophany undertook, his friends, other learned beings of that time with whom he shared the beginnings 
of his various elucidatory experiments on his constatations. Having become interested in this, also participated in these further researches of his. Well then, after long and detailed researches, this group of learned three-brained beings of your planet first became aware and categorically convinced that almost all the cosmic results observed around them which are actualized in the course of their manifestness in external transitory states perceived by the organs of beings in some or other definite form always have seven independent aspects. As a result of the conscious labors of these several learned three-brained beings of your planet that branch of almost normal science then arose and began to grow on the continent Atlantis under the name of Tazaluri Nono, the sense of which meant the seven aspectness of every whole phenomenon. But when that continent perished, and absolutely nothing survived from this branch of genuine science, then again, during the course of very many centuries, the beings of this planet knew nothing about this sacred cosmic law. Evidently this branch of science on the continent Atlantis was so widely known that it was not found necessary to include anything about it in elegomenism, as was usually done, as I've already told you, by the learned beings of the continent Atlantis for all those notions, the knowledge of which they wished to transmit unchanged to beings of future generations. If a legomenism concerning this branch of science had also existed, then something or other would certainly have survived of this knowledge, as had survived of other knowledge attained by the beings of Atlantis through those who were by chance saved after the loss of that continent. The knowledge concerning the sacred Heptaparapashanach was again known only after many, many of their centuries thanks to two great terrestrial learned beings, the brothers Chun Kil Tez and Chun Tro Pel, who later became saints, and who are now on that holy planet purgatory where we recently were. Do you remember? I already told you that on the continent of Asia there was a country, Maral Plesi, and that a king existed there by the name Kanuzion a descendant of that learned member of the Society of Akaldans, who had gone there from Atlantis for the observation of all kinds of natural phenomena of their planet. Just that same king, who had invented for his subjects the wise tale already mentioned by me in order to save them from the pernicious habit of chewing the seeds of the flower Gulgulian. Well then, to the grandson of this king, Canuzion, after the arising of an heir, who later also became king over the beings of this group, there arose just these same two results of the male sex, twins, the elder of whom was called Chun Kil Tez, and the younger Chun Tro Pel. The word Chun, then in the country Maral Plesi, meant prince. Owing on the one hand to the fact that the environment of these two brothers, direct descendants of one of the chief members of the great learned society, happened to be arranged correspondingly for their preparatory age, and on the other hand that they themselves tried not to allow the atrophy of the hereditary inherency, which they as in general all newly arising three-brained beings of this planet have, to crystallize the data for engendering in themselves the power to actualize being particle duty, and also in consequence of the fact that the affirming source of the causes of their arising, that is, their, as is called, father, decided to destine their responsible existence for the field of learning, and took all corresponding measures for their preparation for this. Then, already from the very beginning of their responsible age, they almost became such as three-brained beings everywhere on the planets of our great megalocosmos become, who chose the same aim. 
that is to say, those who carry out all their studied researches, not for the satisfaction of their what are called vainglorious, proud, and self-loving weaknesses, as is done by the beings there, particularly the contemporary ones who choose the same field for themselves, but for the attainment of a higher gradation of being. At the outset they became, as is said there, learned specialists in medicine, and afterwards learned in general. The period of their preparatory age and the early years of their responsible existence were spent in the town Gob, in the country Maral Plessis. But when this part of the surface of your planet began to be buried under sand, they were both among the number of those refugees who went east. This group of three-brained beings, refugees from the country Maral Plessis, among whom were also these two twin brothers, later great learned beings, crossed the eastern heights of Maral Plessis and settled on the shores of a great water space. There was afterwards formed from them a settled group of these terrestrial three-brained beings still existing today, which, as well as the country which it inhabits, is now called China. Well then, in this new place of permanent existence called China, these same two brothers were the first to constate and to cognize after the loss of the continent Atlantis the fundamental cosmic law of the sacred Heptaparapashanoch. It is in the highest degree an interesting and curious circumstance that the initial source for this constatation of theirs was the totality of cosmic substances localized in just that same surplanetary formation which is now called their Papavarun, or as it is still called, Poppy. And owing to the implanting of the habit of chewing the seeds of this poppy, their great-grandfather, the great King Canusion, first invented his, as already mentioned by me, religious teaching. There were evidently transmitted by inheritance to these two great terrestrial learned beings from their great-grandfather, the great King Canusion, in addition to the ability of well considering and cognizing their being duty in relation to beings around them similar to themselves, also an interest in and a passion for the study of this product, which has always been for your favorites one of the innumerable harmful means which have brought their psyche, already enfeebled without this, to its ultimate degeneracy. In order that you may better represent to yourself and well understand why just such a small planetary formation as I mentioned, named Papavarun or Poppy, was the cause of the constatation by these great terrestrial learned beings of that most great cosmic law, you must first of all know that on all planets, for the purposes of transformation of common cosmic substances during the process of iran iran -umange, there arise, among all kinds of surplanetary and intraplanetary formations in general, as well as among formations called flora in particular, three classes of formations. The formations belonging to the first class are called Unastralnian arisings. Those belonging to the second class, Ochtatralnian arisings. And those belonging to the third class, Polormedechtian arisings. Through the Unastralnian arisings, there are transformed in their evolutionary or involutionary processes those cosmic crystallizations, or active elements, which obtain their arising only from the substances transformed by that planet itself, on which that kind of surplanetary or intraplanetary formation is formed for the purposes of the common cosmic iran iran -umange. Through the Ochtatralnian arisings, there are transformed besides what I've already mentioned, 
also those active elements which obtain their primary arisings from the substances transformed by the Sun itself and the other planets of the given solar system. And through the arisings of the third class, namely the Palor Medechtian, there are transformed, besides the first two classes, also all those active elements which primarily arise from the transformations of the substances of various cosmic concentrations belonging to other solar systems of our common megalocosmos. The surplanetary flora formation mentioned by me, named on your planet the plant Papavarun, belongs to the class of Polormodectian arisings, and through it there evolves or involves what is called the totality of the results of the transformation of all other cosmic gravity center concentrations, which come into the atmosphere of this planet of yours through the common cosmic process of what is called ubiquitous diffusion of the radiations of all kinds of cosmic concentrations. Well then, my boy, after these two great terrestrial learned beings, Chun Kil Tez and Chun Tro Pel, had more or less arranged the new place of their permanent existence in the then still quite young China, they began to continue the intentional actualization in their common presences of being particle duty, interrupted through no fault of theirs, in the field of the profession chosen by them, for their responsible existence, namely scientific research, in the branch called medicine. They then began to investigate that totality of cosmic substances which still, before this, your favorites had learned to obtain there from the mentioned Palormodectian plant, and which they named opium, which then denoted, in the speech of the beings of that group, dream maker. These two great brothers then began to investigate this opium in consequence of the fact that they as well as many other three-brained beings of that time noticed that on the introduction into themselves of a certain species of this mass every painful sensation temporarily disappeared. They first of all set out to elucidate the action of all its properties in order perhaps to find a possibility by means of one of its properties to destroy or change for the better that special form of psychic illness which had then become very widely spread among the refugees around them, three-brained beings like themselves. During these researches of theirs, they first of all noticed that this same opium consists of seven independent crystallizations with definite subjective properties. And on further and more detailed investigations, they definitely constated that each of these seven independent crystallizations of this one whole consists in its turn of seven others, also definite crystallizations with their seven independent subjective properties and these in their turn again of seven, and so on almost to infinity. This then so greatly astonished and interested them, that they put aside all the problems they had previously set themselves, and from then on, exclusively and perseveringly occupied themselves with the investigation of this fact, which had astonished them, and which they had first constated, and ultimately attained to those results which both before, even at the period of the existence of the continent Atlantis, and at any other period later, were unprecedented for the three brain beings of your planet. Many centuries after the period of the planetary existence of these terrestrial great learned beings, now saints Chunkiltes and Chuntropel, when I happened for one of my elucidations to become acquainted in detail with the history of their activities, it appeared that when they had become convinced beyond doubt that such a totality of cosmic substances as is named opium consists of a whole range of compounds with seven diversely subjectively propertied active elements, they then began with the same aim 
to investigate many other cosmic results, or, as is said there, phenomena, which proceeded in their environment. But later, in these investigations of theirs, they confined themselves only to three, namely, to this same opium, to what is called the white ray, and to what is called sound. Investigating the mentioned three diversely manifested results of cosmic processes, they then, among other things, categorically made clear and became convinced beyond any doubt that although all these three results, in respect of the causes of their arising and outer manifestations, have nothing in common with each other, yet their inner construction and functioning are nevertheless exactly alike down to the smallest detail. In brief, then, for the second time on your planet, in this still quite young China, after the loss of the continent Atlantis, these two twin brothers again constated and categorically made clear that all the separate and, by their exterior, independent phenomena, if each of them is taken as a unit, are in the totality of their manifestations again seven secondary independent units, having their own subjective properties, that these secondary independent units in their turn consist of seven tertiary units, and so on to infinity, and that in each of these primary, secondary, tertiary, etc. units, the processes of mutual relation and mutual influence proceed equally in every detail down to the smallest exactitudes and with equal consequences. By the way, during their investigations, they then first defined with separate names the first seven independent aspects taken by them of the whole result as well as their secondary and tertiary derivatives. Namely, the first seven fundamental aspects of each whole they called 1. Erti Pikan On 2. Ori Pikan On 3. Sami Pikan On 4. Ochti Pikan On 5. Kuti Pikanon, six, Epsi Pikanon, seven, Shvidi Pikanon, and the secondary, one, Erti Nurachaka, two, Ori Nurachaka, three, Sami Nurachaku, four, Ochti Nurachaka. 5. Kuti Nurachaka 6. Epsi Nurachaka 7. Shvidi Nurachaku And in order to distinguish to which of the three mentioned results of cosmic processes the given definition referred, they added, after each of these definitions, the following. For the definition of the nuances of sound, they, noting the number of their vibrations, always added to this word alil. For the definition of the particularities of the composite of the white ray, they added the expression nahranura. And for the definition of the active elements of the polormodexian product called opium, they added only the number of their what is called specific gravity. And to define specific vibration and specific gravity, these great terrestrial learned beings took as the standard unit the unit of vibration of sound, then first called by them the Nuryo-Nosian world sound. I will explain to you a little later about the meaning of the definition Nuryo-Nosian world sound, first adopted by the then great learned beings of the earth. But meanwhile, for the clarity of the understanding of my subsequent elucidations of the given theme, you must also know that everywhere on the planets, 
genuine scientists take as the standard unit for their confrontative calculations of specific gravity and specific vibrations. That part, established by objective science, of the most most sacred Theomart Malogos, which still contains all the fullness of what is called the vivifyingness of all the three holy forces of the sacred Triamazikamno. But on your planet, genuine scientists, as well as those of new formation of all periods, took, and until today still take, as such a standard unit, what is called the atom of hydrogen for the same purpose, namely for the confrontative calculations of all those diversely propertied definite parts of some or other whole which had become known to them, as, for instance, for the specific gravity of various active elements which had become known to them among the number which ought to be present in the spheres surrounding their existence, Considering this atom of hydrogen for some unknown reason to be, in general, the smallest, and also indivisible. It must not be overlooked that these sorry scientists from among your favorites do not even suspect that if this atom of hydrogen of theirs is indeed the smallest and indivisible, there in all spheres of their planet, then this does not mean that it cannot be broken up many times more within the limits of other solar systems, or even in the spheres of certain other planets of their own solar system. By the way, you should know that this same hydrogen of theirs is just one of those seven cosmic substances which in their general totality actualize specially for the given solar system what is called the inner Ansapalnian octave of cosmic substances, which independent octave in its turn is a one-seventh independent part of the fundamental common cosmic Ansapalnian octave. Such an inner independent Ansapalnian octave is likewise present in that solar system to which our dear Karatas belongs. And we call these seven heterogeneous cosmic substances of different properties. 1. Planakorab, which is just their hydrogen. 2. Alilonofarab. 3. Krilnomolnifarab. 4. Tolko Prafarab. Five, Hrito Falmono Farab. Six, Siriu Nori Farab. Seven, Klana Noi Zu Farab. And on your planet, the genuine learned beings at different periods called by various names these seven relatively independent crystallizations of different properties or according to their expression, active elements, which compose the inner Ansapalnian octave of their own solar system. The contemporary, as they call it, learned chemists there, however, who are already learned of new formation of the first water, call them 1. Hydrogen, 2. Fluorine, 3. Chlorine, 4. Bromine, 5. Iodine. For the last two definite crystallizations they have no names at all because their names did not reach them from their ancestors, and at the present time they even do not suspect the existence on their planet of these two cosmic substances, although these two cosmic substances are the principal necessary factors for their own existence. These two latter cosmic substances, which might be quite tangible and quite accessible in all spheres of their planet, were still known only about two centuries ago among the scientific beings there, who were then called alchemists, but whom the contemporary comic scientists simply call occult charlatans, considering them to be only exploiters of human naivete, and were called by them hydroumiac, 
and Petra Karnach. And so, my boy, these great terrestrial learned beings, now saints, the twin brothers Chun Kiltes and Chun Tropel, were the first, after the loss of Atlantis, to lay anew the foundation of this knowledge. They not only laid anew the foundation of this totality of special information, but they were even the first there on earth who also constated two of the three chief law-conformable particularities present in that great law, about which I've already spoken to you. And namely, they were the first to constate two of its midnell inns. They then called that branch of genuine knowledge, similar to that which on the continent Atlantis was called the seven aspectness of every whole phenomenon, the law of ninefoldness. And they called it thus because they added to the seven obvious different manifestations called by them Dusako of this great law. These two particularities first constated by them and named by them Suanso Turabizo, which name meant obligatory gap aspects of the unbroken flowing of the whole. And they named this law thus chiefly because, during their detailed researches, they became convinced beyond all doubt that in all the cosmic transitory results they investigated, these particularities first constated by them likewise obligatorily always proceed in certain places of the process of this great law. These two great terrestrial Chinese learned beings, then, had recourse for their elucidatory experiments to every kind of what are called chemical, physical, and mechanical experiments. And they gradually formed one very complicated and in the highest degree edifying experimental apparatus, which they called Ala Atapan. By means of this apparatus Ala Atapan, they then clearly proved to themselves and to others that in the very essence of all these three transitory results of cosmic processes, and namely in the Palormedectian product called their opium, in the white ray and in sound there are the same properties, and namely there are in all these three outwardly quite different cosmic phenomena precisely the same in what are called actualizing constructions. That is to say, for their manifestness, there are in them precisely the same mutually acting law conformablenesses. And in all three of these outwardly different apparently independent manifestations, the functioning of these mutually acting law conformablenesses have precisely the same action on each other as they have in their own manifestations. That is to say, the dus zako of any one result acts on the corresponding dus zako of another, precisely the same as it functions in the dus zako, which is one of the seven aspects of this whole cosmic result. This same apparatus, by means of which these great brothers made their elucidatory experiments, I saw with my own eyes many centuries after that period when they existed there, and I became very well acquainted with its construction. As the cause of my personal acquaintance with all the details of the construction and action of this remarkable experimental apparatus, a la Atapan, was due to accidental circumstances connected with my essence friend, Gurnahur Harhach. And as it will surely interest you very much, and at the same time will be exceedingly instructive for you, I shall describe it to you in somewhat greater detail. My personal exhaustive study of this astonishing apparatus, a la Atapan, which became, thanks to Gurnahur Harhach, famous among the genuine scientists of almost the whole of our megalocosmos, proceeded according to the following chance circumstances. Just at the time 
of one of my sojourns on the planet Saturn with my essence friend Gornohor Harhash. He, having already previously in some way heard about this apparatus, requested me, during conversation, to bring him one of these experimental apparatuses from the planet Earth if I again happened to be there. And when, afterwards, I again visited the surface of this planet of yours, I procured there one of these apparatuses, and took it with me to the planet Mars, in order to send it on a convenient occasion to the planet Saturn to Gornohor Harhar. And so, in consequence of the fact that for a long time our ship occasion did not happen to go to the planet Saturn, this apparatus, a la Atapan, remained at my home on the planet Mars, and it often came within the sphere of the automatic perception of the organs of my sight. And during a period of rest from active mentation, I attentively examined it and ultimately became familiar with all the details of its construction and action. This famous experimental apparatus, a la Atapan, consisted of three independent parts. The forepart was called Lusochepana, the middle part, Zenvoch, and the last, the hind part, was called Ryank Pokotarts. Each of these three parts, in their turn, consisted of several special and separate adaptations. The first part, which was named Lusoshepana had a special cone-shaped pipe, the wide end of which was hermetically fitted into a frame of the sole window of that room where the experiments were made. And the other end was like a small chink-like aperture with what is called a collecting disc, passing through which what are called the rays of daylight, coming from the window, were transformed into, as your favorites would say, a concentrated white ray. This concentrated white ray, thereupon passing through a crystal of a special form, was broken up into several different colored rays, which, as is said, fell upon a small slab made of ivory and called Pyrengiel. This slab, Pyrengiel, was so constructed and regulated that the colored rays falling on it were again concentrated, but this time otherwise, and proceeding through the second crystal, also of a special form, fell on another but larger slab, also made of ivory, and called Polorish Burda. Opposite this Polorish Burda was a small apparatus of a special construction through which, on its being shifted in a certain way, any chosen colored ray there could be directed further from this Polorish Burda onto the third part of the Ala Atapan called Ryank Pokortarts. Here, by the way, you might as well also be told that the knowledge relating to the construction of the first crystal of this part of the apparatus Ala Atapan also reached down to your contemporary favorites, and they now call this crystal a prism. Through this prism, contemporary terrestrial learned beings also obtain seven colored rays from the white ray, and they also fancy that through this they can learn about certain other cosmic phenomena. But of course, from these fancies of theirs, and from all kinds of other forms of their scientific titillation, Nothing is obtained, only because through this prism of theirs they obtain from the white ray only what are called negative colored rays. And in order to understand any other cosmic phenomena connected with the transitory changes of this white ray, they must obligatorily have what are called positive colored rays. Your contemporary favorites, however, imagine that the colored rays which they obtain by means of this child's toy of theirs, called by them prism, are just those same positive rays which the great scientists obtained. And according to their naivety, they think that the, as they call it, spectrum, 
which they obtain from the white rays, gives just that order of the arising of the rays in which they issue from their sources. And meanwhile, in the given case, concerning these terrestrial sorry scientists of new formation among your favorites, one can only utter the expression often used by them themselves, to hell with them. It is not for nothing that several of our sacred individuals in general do not call your contemporary favorites otherwise than freaks. And so, thanks to these two crystals, these great learned beings obtained from the white ray its positive colored rays, and afterwards, with the help of the slab, Polorish Burda, which was a part of the Lusocepana, any one of these colored rays was directed to the third and principal demonstrating part of this astonishing apparatus, namely to the Riank Pokortars. This principal part, however, consisted of an ordinary three-legged stand, on top of which two balls, also of ivory, were fitted one upon the other in a certain way, the upper ball being much larger than the lower one. On the lower, smaller ball, just opposite that part of the Lusocepana, through which the positive colored rays had already passed, a cavity of a special form was made, into which either the whole of the said polormadectian product named opium or a single active elements required for the experiments were placed during the experiments. Now the upper ball was bored right through, diametrically horizontal, to the Lusocepana. And on this large ball, there was also radially perpendicular to this large bore drilled right through, yet another smaller bore, reaching only to the center, of which was just opposite the Lusocepana. This second bore, drilled halfway through, was made in such a way that the colored rays could be directed as desired either directly from the Lusocepana or reflected from the said cavity of the lower smaller ball. Through the open bore of the large ball, a what is called bamboo, previously prepared in a special manner, could be freely moved. A long time before the experiments, many of these bamboos were soaked together in absolute darkness, or in, as is said there on the earth, orange light obtained from the burning of simkalash, which was obtained from a certain kind of what is called clay, deposited in the soil of your planet, and the deposits of which are usually found near accumulations of salunilovian acids which in their turn are formed from mamzolin, or as your favorites call it, naphtha. These bamboos were soaked in a liquid consisting of, one, the white of the eggs of the bird then called amersamarskenapa, two, the juice of the plant called chiltunach, three, the excretion of a quadruped being bearing the name Kesmaral. 4. A specially prepared what is called mercury amalgam. When these bamboos had been thoroughly soaked, they were inserted one by one into other thicker bamboos which had not been prepared in the said manner, and the ends of which were hermetically sealed. These latter preparations were, of course, also made in absolute darkness, or in the orange light of Simkalash. Later, when these soaked bamboos were necessary for the experiment, one end of the thicker, unsoaked bamboo was inserted in a special way into the mentioned bore, drilled right through the large ball of the Riank Pokartarts, and opened by a small hook fixed to a thin stick by means of which the soaked bamboo could be moved at any speed desired. Now the action of the said liquid in which the bamboo was soaked 
was such that the part of the soaked bamboo on which the colored ray coming directly from the luso cepana, or after being reflected from the cavity of the lower, smaller ball, fell, was instantly permanently dyed the same color as that ray which had fallen onto it. The uncovered places of these bamboos soaked in the said manner were dyed the colors also corresponding to the sound vibrations which touched them, and which were obtained from what are called strings, which were on the middle of the apparatus called zenvok. This zenvok consisted of a very strong frame of special form made from the tusks of mammoths on which there were stretched many strings of various lengths and thicknesses, made partly from the twisted what are called goat's intestines, and partly from the tail hairs of beings there of various exterior forms. Tell me, please, my dear grandfather, what is a mammoth? asked Hassein. A mammoth, replied Beelzebub, is a two-brained being, in the beginning it also bred on your planet, and had, in comparison with other beings there, of all brain systems, a large exterior form. This kind of being also became a victim of the consequences of that large piece broken off from the planet Earth, and now called Moon, which is now an independent, as I expressed it, planetary upstart of this solar system ores, and the chief bearer of evil to this ill-fated planet of yours. The point is that when the atmosphere of this small planetary upstart began to be formed and became gradually harmonized, great winds arose in the atmosphere of the planet Earth, owing to which several regions of its surface, you remember I've already spoken about this to you, were buried with sand. Moreover, at this time, snow constantly fell in what are called the north and south polar regions of its atmosphere, and all the depressions of the surface of these north and south polar terra firma regions were covered by these falls of snow. The beings of this exterior form used to breed on the mentioned regions of the terra firma surface of your planet, and during these unprecedented, as it is said there, snowstorms, they were all also buried by snow. And since then this species of beings has never again been re-established there. It is interesting to notice that at the present time there, in these depressions formerly covered with snow, and which were later covered with kashiman, that is, with those substances which in general form on the surface of terra firma regions what is called soil, there are sometimes still found now even well-preserved planetary bodies of these mammoths. These planetary bodies of mammoths have been so well-preserved for such a long time because these snows were then very soon after covered with kashiman, and thus there obtained the condition of Isoliaxoclanis, that is, as your favorites would say, the condition of a hermetically closed sphere, in which these planetary bodies of mammoths have never since been exposed, as is said there, to decomposition. That is to say, the active elements of which these planetary bodies are in general formed have not completely involved back to their prime origin. And so, my boy, the astonishing apparatus, a la Atapan, which I described, demonstrated that all the three mentioned transitory results of cosmic processes not only manifest themselves alike in their inner manifestations, but they are also formed from the same factors. By means of this apparatus, it was possible to verify and be convinced that in each of the mentioned three transitory results ensuing from common cosmic processes, and which have nothing in common outwardly with each other, there not only proceeds exactly similar what are called mutual actions ensuing one from the other and forming one common functioning, and that in the sense of the evolutionary and involutionary particularities of the law of Heptaparaparshanoch, 
The action of each separate intermediary stage in one general functioning influences the action of each separate intermediary stage in another, exactly as in its own. But also, that according to the particularities of the properties of the vibrations which compose their aggregate, these transitory cosmic results have complete affinity. This complete affinity in the inner mutual relations of these three transitory results which have outwardly nothing in common with each other was proved in the following way. For instance, a corresponding colored ray directed upon any active element of opium transformed it into another active element which corresponded in its newly acquired vibrations to the vibrations of the colored ray which had acted on the given active element. The same result was obtained if instead of these colored rays corresponding sound vibrations of the strings of the Zenvoch were directed upon this same active element. Further, if any colored ray were made to pass through any active element of opium, then passing through it this same ray took on another color, namely that color the vibrations of which corresponded to the vibrations of this active element. Or if any colored ray were made to pass through the manifested what are called wave of sound vibrations, still acting at the given moment from any corresponding string of the Zenvoch, then passing through this wave it took on another color a corresponding to the vibrations manifested by means of the given string. Or finally, if a definite colored ray and definite sound vibration from the strings were simultaneously directed upon any active element of opium, from among those composing this polormadectian product, and which had a smaller number of vibrations than the totality of vibrations of the colored ray and of the said sound, then this active element was transformed into such another active element of opium, the number of whose vibrations exactly corresponded to the totality of the numbers of the said two different caused vibrations, and so on and so forth. This incomparable experimental apparatus likewise demonstrated that all the higher vibrations of one result always give the direction to all the lower vibrations of other transitory cosmic results. After all that has just now been related to you, my boy, you can now be given that information, thanks to which there might be crystallized in your mentation data for the representation into what general form the results of the tenacious impartial conscious labors of these saints, the twin brothers, the terrestrial great scientists, were then molded in this China. And in addition, also, data for the representation concerning the degrees of the successive deterioration of being reason in the presences of these unfortunate terrestrial three-brained beings. And so, when for the second time from my observation of the existence of these three-brained beings who have taken your fancy, there arose on this still quite young China, thanks to the mentioned two great terrestrial scientists, the twin brothers, an independent branch of genuine science, that is, the totality of the information concerning the special question thoroughly cognized by perfected reason of three-brained beings who had existed earlier, in the given case concerning the fundamental cosmic law of the sacred Heptaparapashanach, then called the law of ninefoldness. Then this branch of science was not only handed down almost normally in an unchanged form from generation to generation during the first two or three centuries, counting from the time of the sacred Raskawarno of the great twin brothers, but it even gradually became, thanks to their followers, also genuine learned beings of that period, as it is said, detailized, and became accessible to the perception of even ordinary beings. This proceeded, then, G. 
chiefly because the practice which had been established by the learned beings of the continent Atlantis, of handing down such information to the beings of subsequent generations only through beings who were genuine initiates, still continued among them. I must not fail, my boy, to remark and acknowledge with conviction that indeed if such an already long established practice had continued, though automatically in the process of the existence of these unfortunate three-brained beings who have taken your fancy, then in the given case just such a totality of true information already thoroughly cognized by the reason of their still relatively normal ancestors might have remained intact and might also have become the possession of your contemporary favorites and those of them who constantly strive not to become ultimate victims of the consequences of the for them accursed organ kundabuffer might take advantage of this information with the aim of easing their already almost impossible what is called inner struggle. To the regret of all more or less conscious relatively independent separate individuals of our great megalocosmos, and to the misfortune of all subsequent three-brained beings who arose on this ill-fated planet of yours, during the mentioned period, namely during two or three of their centuries, the gradual distortion and ultimate almost total destruction began of just that blessing which had been created for them by their great ancestors, thanks to their conscious labors and intentional sufferings. This followed from two causes. The first cause was that thanks to the same abnormal conditions of external being existence established by them themselves, certain of them were formed into responsible beings with that special organic psychic need which in their speech might be formulated thus an irresistible thirst to be considered as learned by beings around them similar to themselves and such an psycho-organic need began to engender in them that strange inherency about which I have many times spoken and which is called by them cunning wiseacring. By the way, my boy, bear in mind once for all that when I used and will use the expression learned beings of new formation, I refer and will refer to those of your favorites, the learned beings just mentioned by me, who have this specific inherency. The other cause was that thanks at that period to certain external circumstances not depending on them and which ensue from common cosmic processes chiefly owing to the action of the law of Sulunensius, the being data crystallized in them which engendered the impulses of what are called sensing and foreseeing began to weaken in the common presences of the genuine initiated beings and they began to take such newly formed types as I have just described and to initiate them into some of the totalities of the true information known to them alone among which was also that totality I mentioned and from that time on this branch of genuine knowledge which had already at that time become the possession of most of them gradually began to be distorted and was ultimately again nearly quite forgotten. I employed the word almost when I referred to the ultimate almost total destruction of that blessing because some fragments from the whole totality of this in the objective sense important true information nevertheless began after the lapse of the mentioned period there when their relatively normal process of being existence was again re-established to be again handed down to subsequent generations exclusively only through genuine initiates and being handed down by succession from generation to generation reached unchanged even to your contemporary favorites though to a very limited number of them there remained however as the possession of most of your contemporary favorites from all this true knowledge which had already been attained and thoroughly cognized by their great remote ancestors 
those several practical unimportant fragments which had automatically reached them, and which in the mentioned confused period were very widely spread among most of the ordinary beings of this then still quite young China. Among those unimportant fragments which automatically reached most of the contemporary favorites of yours, there are, firstly, several methods of separating from the polormodectian product named opium certain of its independent active elements. Secondly, what is called the law of combination of colors. And thirdly, what is called the seven-toned scale of sound. As regards the first of the enumerated three fragments of the practical results attained by the reason of three-brained beings of this ancient China, and which reached to your contemporary favorites, it is necessary to tell you that in consequence of the fact that certain of the constituent parts of this whole product called their opium became from then on thanks to the special properties of their agreeable action on the abnormal general psyche of the beings, to be continuously used by them. Therefore, the knowledge of many methods of getting certain of its independent active elements began to be transmitted from generation to generation and reached down to your contemporary favorites. And at the present time, they also obtain many of its definite parts, and use them very avidly for the satisfaction of always the same consequences of the properties of the organ Kundabuffer crystallized in them. These parts, extracted by them from the general composition of this polormedectian product, have of course already other names among your contemporary favorites. A contemporary comical learned chemist, a certain Mendeleev, even collected the names of all those active elements now obtained and classified them as it were according to their atomic weights. Although his classification does not correspond at all to reality, yet nevertheless, according to these atomic weights of his, it is possible approximately to establish that classification which was made by the great terrestrial learned beings of the future China. Of the number of nearly 400 active elements of opium, which then became known to the great brothers, knowledge of how to obtain only 42 active elements has reached the contemporary chemists of the earth. And these active elements have now the following names there. 1. Morphine. 2. Protopine. 3. Lanthopine. 4. Porphyroxine. 5. Opium or nicotine. 6. Paramorphine or Thebane. 7. Formine or Pseudoformine. 8. Metaphormine. 9. Noscopine. 10. Oilopine. 11. Atropine. 12. Pyrotine. 13. Defteropine. 14. Tictopine. 15. Collatine. 16. Kaivatine. 17. Zootine. 18. Trotopine. 19. Laudanine. 20. Laudanosine. 21. Podotorine. 22. Arcatosine. 23. Tokitosine. 24. Lictonosine. 25. Macanadine. 26. Papavarine. 27. Crintonine. 28. Codomine. 29. Colomanine. 30. Coilonanine. 31. Caternine. 
32. Hydrocatarnine. 33. Opionine. Mechanine. 34. Meconoisine. 35. Pistotorine. 36. Phytonosine. 37. Codeine. 38. Nartzine. 39. Pseudocodine. 40. Microparane. 41. Microtibane. 42. Mesane. The last time I was on your planet, I heard that the contemporary learned beings of the community Germany found, as it were, methods of separating several other independent active elements from opium. But as I had already become convinced before this that the contemporary scientists of that community firstly, for the most part, only fantasy, and secondly, like the beings of ancient Greece, do not prepare anything good or beneficial for future generations, I therefore did not interest myself in these, as it were, new, as they also call them, scientific attainments, and do not know the names of these new active elements of the present day. As regards the second fragment of the practical results attained by the reason of the same beings of ancient China, and which has reached down to contemporary beings, namely the knowledge relating to the law of the combination of colors, then all the information concerning this has been handed down almost all the time from generation to generation but each year it always underwent a greater change for the worse and was only two centuries ago ultimately forgotten at the present time some information relating to this law still continues to pass down and to become known only to certain of the three-brained beings there who belong to the group of beings there named Persians. But now that the influence of what is called contemporary European painting is automatically spreading more and more widely in this group, then one must of course expect there the speedy and also total, as our esteemed teacher says, evaporation of this information. And as regards the seven-toned scale of sound, which had reached them from the ancient Chinese beings, then you must be informed about this as detailedly as possible, because, first of all, thanks to this information, you will better understand about the laws of vibration, in which all the peculiarities of the sacred Hepteparapashenoch can be constated and cognized. And, secondly, because among those things intentionally reproduced by those same three-brained beings of yours who have taken your fancy, for daily use in their general existence, I brought home from there also one sound-producing instrument, namely their piano, on which the vibration-engendering strings were placed, which could be arranged just as on the Zenvoch, that is, the second special part of the famous experimental apparatus a la Atapan, which was created by the great twin brothers, and on which, when we return on to our dear Karatas, I shall be able to explain to you by demonstration what is called the successiveness of the processes of the mutual blending of vibrations. Thanks to these practical explanations of mine, you will more easily be able to represent to yourself and approximately to cognize just how and in which successiveness in our great megalocosmos the process of the most great trogoautoegocrat proceeds and in what way the large and small cosmic concentrations arise. Relating about how such a fragment of practical result from the ancient true knowledge survived and automatically reached down to your contemporary favorites, I shall first of all elucidate to you with more accuracy about this same definite law of vibrations, which was first formulated by the great brothers, 
as the seven gravity center vibrations of sound. I already said that in the beginning, while that totality of true information or that fragment of genuine knowledge was handed down from the beings of one generation to the beings of subsequent generations, only through the genuine initiates there. It not only underwent a change in the entirety of the exact sense put into it, but it even began, thanks to other also genuine learned beings among their followers of subsequent generations, to be detailized and became accessible then to the perception of even ordinary three-brained terrestrial beings. Among these followers, a century and a half after the sacred Roscoarno of the Saint Brothers, there was a certain genuine learned being, King Tu Taz by name, who, on the basis of the principles of the construction of the middle part of the apparatus, Allah Atapan, named Zenvoch, propounded a very detailed theory under the name Evolution and Involution of Vibrations. And for the confirmation of this theory of his, he made a special elucidatory apparatus, which he called Lav Mers Noch, and which, by the way, later became also widely known among almost all the learned beings of our great megalocosmos. The said apparatus, Lav Mers Noch, like the middle part of the Ala Atapan, consisted of a very strong frame with a great many strings stretched on it made from the intestines and tail hairs of various quadruped beings there. One end of each string was fixed to one edge of this frame, and the other to pegs inserted into another edge. These pegs were inserted in such a way that they could be freely turned in their what are called peg holes, and the strings fixed on to them could at will be tightened or loosened as much as was necessary for the required number of vibrations. Of the great number of strings stretched on the Lav Mers Noch, forty-nine were colored white, and the totality of vibrations, that is to say the definite sound obtained from the vibrations of each one of them, was called a whole center of gravity of the octave, which definite sound corresponded to that which your favorites now call a whole note. Each seven strings of these gravity center sounds, or whole notes, were then and are still called an octave. In this way there were stretched on the apparatus Lav Mers Noch seven octaves of whole notes, the totality of the general consonants of which gave what is called the sacred Hanziano, that is, just what the two great brothers suspected, and which happened almost exactly to coincide with what, as I've already said, they then named Nereonosian world sound. Each such an octave of strings on the Lav Mers Noch gave that totality of vibrations which, according to the calculations of the great twin brothers, correspond to the totality of vibrations of all those cosmic substances which, issuing from seven separate independent sources, compose one of the seven centers of gravity of the fundamental common cosmic Ansapalnian octave. Each white string on the Lav Mers Noch was tuned separately by this Chinese learned being, King Tu Tos, in such a way that it gave that average number of vibrations which, according to the calculations of the great brothers, ought also to be in substances which are one of the seven centers of gravity of the given whole totality of substances, which, in its turn, is one of the seven centers of gravity of the fundamental cosmic octave of substances. On the Lav Mers Noch, each octave, as well as each whole note of the octave, had names of their own, 
and namely the highest octave of the strings, was called Arachiapalnish. The second highest, Erkrodiapan. The third highest, Erordiapan. The fourth highest, Korodiapan. The fifth highest, Piangiapan. The sixth highest, Vetserordiapan. The seventh highest, Achterordiapan. And the gravity center strings themselves were painted white and were called the same in all octaves, but with the addition of the name of the given octave itself, and namely these whole notes were called the first highest Adashtanas, the second highest Evotanas, the third highest Gavorktanis, the fourth highest Maikitanis, the fifth highest Midotanis, the sixth highest, Lukotanas, the seventh highest, Sonitanis. The contemporary beings of the earth now call these same whole notes Do, Si, La, Sol, Fa, Mi, Re. By the way, my boy, in order that the greatness of these two saints, brothers, should be still more evident to you, I draw your attention to the fact that the calculations made by them and the qualitativeness established by these calculations of what is called the vivifyingness of vibrations of sound, which corresponded according to their suppositions with the vivifyingness of cosmic sources of substances, appeared to coincide almost exactly with reality. This merit of theirs was all the greater because as terrestrial beings they had no true information about this and were able to make their correct suppositions and almost accurate calculations of many objective cosmic truths exclusively only thanks to their own conscious labors and intentional sufferings. Further, on this lav mers noch, in each octave, between these white strings or whole notes, this learned being, King Tu Toz, strung in certain places five further strings, this time painted black. These black strings, however, he named Demisachsachsa, which, according to the terminology of the beings of the earth, corresponded to what they call half notes. And these half note strings on the Lav Mers Noch were not strung between those whole notes between which, according to the indications of the saints Chun Kil Tez and Chun Tro Pel, there is, according to the sacred Heptaparapashanach, no possibility of the independence of the evolution and involution of the vibrations of sound. And these places, they were the first to call gaps. And in the given places of the octaves where these gaps ought to be, this learned being, King Tu Toz, strung special strings between the whole notes made of the tail hairs of beings called their horse. These hair strings gave vibrations which were not always the same, and King Tu Toz named these vibrations chaotic. The number of these vibrations obtained from these hair strings depended on the stretching of them, as in the case of other strings, but on other causes, chiefly on three causes ensuing from surrounding cosmic results, namely, on the action of the vibrations dispersed around them obtained from other strings of the Lav Mers Noch, on the state of what is called the temperature of the atmosphere at the given moment, and on the radiations of the beings present nearby without distinction of brain system. On this Lav Mers Noch, between these white, black, and hair strings, there were also strung in each octave fourteen strings also from twisted intestines, 
which were painted red and called Kisukeschur. And if contemporary beings of the earth were to use these strings, they would call them quarter notes. In addition to this, all those quarter note strings, which were stretched on either side of the hair strings, were fitted in such a way that the vibrations issuing from them could at any moment be changed as desired by means of tightening or loosening these strings, and thus the vibrations they produced could be regulated and by ear blended with the frequently changing vibrations obtained from the hair strings. And this was so done because thanks to the frequently changing vibrations of the hair strings, the qualitativeness of which I already said depended on the temperature of the atmosphere, on the radiations of the beings present nearby, and on many other causes, the vibrations of these red strings acquired such a property that if they did not blend with the vibrations of the hair strings, the vibrations issuing from them would act on the beings present very cacophonically harmfully, even to their possible total destruction. With frequent changing, however, of the stretching of the red strings, and with the blending of their vibrations with the general vibrations issuing from the Lavmer's Noch, their harmlessness was obtained. That is to say, owing to this, the general vibrations issuing from the Lav Merz noch, became, for the beings who heard them, what is called harmoniously flowing and not harmfully acting. And so, my boy, this apparatus, Lav Merz noch, and also the detailed theory of this ancient conscientious learned being, King Tutos, suffered the same fate as the incomparable apparatus Allah Atapan, and the whole totality of true information cognized by the brothers. Owing to the continuing and even increasing formation in the sense of quantity of certain of your favorites of the mentioned new type, with the said inherency of cunning wiseacring, all this totality of information was from that time on altered, and its genuine sense and significance gradually forgotten. And as regards how the basic principle of the arrangement of the strings of the apparatus Lav Merz Noch, and also that part of the Allah Atapan, the Zenvoch, automatically reached to your contemporary favorites, this proceeded owing to the following reasons. When the acuteness of the mentioned confused period had passed, and when certain of the surviving fragments from all these great attainments of reason of the still relatively normal three-brained beings of your planet again began to be transmitted to subsequent generations, in that way which before this had already been well established in the process of their ordinary existence, that is to say, the way of transmission only through beings who had already merited to become and to acquire the knowledge of genuine initiates, and when each year from among these latter more and more responsible beings were formed with the inherency just mentioned, then at this same period of time a three-brained being, also a scientist of new formation, who arose in this same China under the name of Chai Yu, was formed into a responsible being and became the cause of the knowledge and practical adoption of this seven-toned scale of sound, becoming generally accessible. And being transmitted from generation to generation, it automatically reached also to your contemporary favorites. In the early years of his responsible existence, this Chai Yu was destined, thanks to certain of his corresponding subjective merits, for a candidate of what is called first degree of initiate. And in consequence, help was given him without his knowledge, as it had long before been established by custom by the genuine initiated beings there, who had to do so to obtain every kind of information relating to various true events which took place on their planet in the past. 
And as my latest detailed investigations elucidated to me, he became worthy, among other things, to be also informed about the great apparatus Lav Mers Noch, in all details of its construction. And then, only in order that similar beings around him should regard him as a scientist, this Chai Yu, being one of the first, so to say, ideally formed scientists of new formation there, that is, a being with a completely formed inherency to Wiseacre, not only wiseacred a new theory of his own on the basis of this information learned by him in the said manner concerning the details of the great apparatus Lav Mers Noch, affirming and denying, so to say, absolutely nothing relating to the laws of vibration. But he also constructed his new simplified sound-producing instrument named King. His simplification consisted in this that without having at all taken into consideration the red and hair strings on the Lav Mers Noch, he made the basis of his sound-producing instrument only the white and black strings, and moreover only the number of strings of two octaves, and he placed them thus, that one whole octave which was found in the middle had for its evolutionary and involutionary continuation half an octave from its next higher octave, and half an octave from its preceding lower octave. And so, although the theory wiseacred by this Chai Yu also did not last very long, yet nevertheless this sound-producing instrument, King, constructed by him, had become generally accessible owing to its simplicity. And in consequence of the fact that the result obtained from it during intentional action turned out to be very good and satisfactory for, so to say, the tickling of many data crystallized in their common presences thanks to the consequences of the properties of the organ Kundabuffer, it began to pass automatically down from generation to generation. Although the outer form of this sound-producing instrument, together with the construction of its frame, the stretch of the strings, and their names, were changed many times by the beings of subsequent generations, having been ultimately formed among your contemporary favorites into their heavy sound-producing instruments, complicated to the degree of idiocy, and in their power incommensurably degenerated to a childish degree, such as clavicymbals, clavichord, organ, grand piano, upright piano, harmonium, and so on. Yet the basic principle of what is called the alternation of gravity center sounds has remained at the present time, such as were actualized by the Saint brothers Chun Kiltez and Chun Tro Pell, on the Zenboch, that is, the middle independent part created by them of the incomparable experimental apparatus a la Atapan. That is why, my boy, this, as it is now called there, Chinese seven-toned subdivision of the octave of sound, simplified by the mentioned Chai Yu, which has reached down to your contemporary favorites and which is used at the present time by them for all their sound-producing instruments enumerated by me, might still, as I've already said, partly serve for, so to say, the practical confrontative study and approximate cognizance of how, in the process of the most great trogo auto egocrat from what is called the flowing of some vibrations from others. Cosmic substances arise of different density and vivifyingness, and in which way, uniting and disuniting among themselves, they form large and small relatively independent concentrations, and thus actualize the common cosmic iran iran -umange. Moreover, you will soon clearly convince yourself about this when, on returning to our dear Karatas, I will show you, as I've already promised, and explain practically the significance of the tuning of that contemporary sound-producing instrument, the piano, 
which was taken by me, among a number of things, from the surface of your planet, and which I brought in order experimentally to elucidate to myself, on being free at home, one of its particularities which I did not have sufficient time to elucidate there on the spot, and which is connected with the strange psyche of these three-brained beings who have taken your fancy, and with the vibrations of different vivifyingness engendered around them. And if, besides this, I now still add, concerning the strange psyche of your favorites, what I constated during my last sojourn among them, namely that none of the contemporary three-brained beings of your planet, in spite of the fact that they, having put this same Chinese seven-tone subdivision as the basis of all their sound-producing instruments, almost daily perceive the results of its consequences, are not only not at all inspired by this as they should be objectively, but on the contrary, under the action of this kind of consonance, with the total absence of remorse, and even with the impulse of satisfaction, intentionally maintain in themselves the flowing of those associations of all their spiritualized parts which arise in their common presences under the influence of data crystallized in them from the consequences of the properties of the, for them, accursed organ Kundabuffer. Then you, I am sure, after such a practical demonstration on this piano, will have not only an approximate representation concerning all what are called some obtained from the other and harmoniously flowing gravity center vibrations, but likewise you will constate once more with the impulse of astonishment to what an extent there is weakened in the common presences of these favorites of yours the essence of the action of those being data which in general are proper to be crystallized in the presences of all three-brained beings, and the totality of which is called quickness of instinct. And so, my boy, thanks on the one hand to the infallibly continuing deterioration in the common presences of these three-brained beings who have taken your fancy, of the quality of the functioning of the data crystallized in them for healthy being mentation, and on the other hand, to the always increasing number among them being formed into responsible beings of the mentioned new types, namely of learned beings of new formation, there ultimately reached the contemporary three-brained beings of this ill-fated planet from this detailed totality of information, already thoroughly cognized by the reason of former beings similar to them, and almost unprecedented everywhere in the universe among ordinary three-brained beings, and which had gradually begun to change, namely the totality of that true information which today is already used for the welfare of ordinary three-brained beings everywhere on the planets of our great megalocosmos, with the exception of the beings of only that planet on which this totality of information arose, only that which our always esteemed Mullah Nazaruddin defines by the following words. Glory to thee, Lord Creator, for having made the teeth of wolves not like the horns of my dear buffalo. For now I can make several excellent combs for my dear wife. And with particular regard to the Chinese seven-tone subdivision of the octave, which has reached down to your contemporary favorites, then although, as I've already said, they use it widely in the process of their ordinary existence, yet at the same time they do not even suspect that such a subdivision was specially created and constructed on those sound principles on which everything existing in the whole of our great megalocosmos is maintained. If one does not consider that insignificant number of three-brained beings of certain small groups who existed on the continent Asia, and who instinctively sensed the hidden meaning of this Chinese division of a whole sound into seven definite centers of gravity, and reproduced it practically, 
exclusively only during such being manifestations of theirs as they considered sacred. Then one may boldly say that in the presences of almost all the three-brained beings who arose on this planet of yours during recent centuries, the data for the cognizance of the altitude of thought and meaning put into this subdivision have already entirely ceased to be crystallized. But the contemporary three-brained beings there who breed on this same continent, Asia, as well as on all other terra firma of the surface of this planet of yours, having already lost every kind of instinctive feeling, all without exception, use it for the satisfaction of only certain of their low purposes unbecoming to three-brained beings. What is most interesting, however, of all the history related by me concerning the cognizance of the sacred law of Heptaparapashanoch by three-brained beings who bred on your planet, and which concerns chiefly the contemporary beings, is that although a great number of all kinds of totalities of special information, or as they themselves express it, separate branches of scientific knowledge, again arose among them at the present time, and began by them, so to say, to be learned by rote, yet concerning the law of vibrations, which branch is the most important, and which gives the possibility, though approximately, of recognizing reality, there is among them absolutely nothing. If, of course, one does not reckon that celebrated what is called theory of sound, which arose comparatively recently and which is seriously studied, and, as it were, known by their contemporary, as they are called, learned physicists and learned musicians. In order that you may, so to say, illuminatingly project the essence of your contemporary favorites, and in view of the fact that the causes of the arising of various misunderstandings widely spread among certain of your favorites in the sphere of this branch of knowledge there are very characteristic and might serve you as excellent material in general for the representation and valuation of the sense and objective significance of all other contemporary separate independent branches of their what is called exact science. I consider it necessary to explain to you in greater detail which theories concerning the vibrations of sound are studied and, as it were, are known by these mentioned contemporary terrestrial sorry scientists. But before speaking about this, my essence again enjoins the whole of my common presence to express my sincere condolence on the fate of all contemporary terrestrial three-brained beings, who, thanks to their persevering being part dog duty, peculiar to them, finally attain to the state of that degree of reason when it becomes inevitable for them to have in their presences also the data of the genuine information relating to the law of vibrations. About this, I, by association at the present moment, remember with the impulse of regret, because at the period of my last sojourn among them, I happened more than once to meet those three-brained beings there who, according to their state of, so to say, psychic perfection, ought of necessity to absorb and transmute in themselves just the true information concerning the law of vibrations. And at the same time, I clearly understand that they could not extract such information from anywhere. There is indeed among them at the present time such a totality of information, or as they themselves name it, a theory of vibrations. Yet the mentioned unfortunate contemporary beings who are in need of this information cannot, in spite of their wishes and efforts, obtain anything tolerably satisfactory for their searchings, except various misconceptions and contradictions. And so, my boy, the basis for the arising of such terrestrial misunderstandings was that various fragments of information concerning the law of vibrations, 
reached contemporary beings from two independent sources, namely from those same ancient Chinese and from those ancient Greeks, about whom, you remember, I have already told you that their community was formed there long ago between the continents of Asia and Europe by those Asiatic fishermen who, out of boredom during bad weather, invented various sciences, among which was just this science of the vibrations of sound. And this science of theirs, later also passing from generation to generation, reached your contemporary favorites almost simultaneously with the said Chinese science. All subsequent misunderstandings began with this, that in the information which had reached them from the ancient Chinese, it was shown that the whole octave of vibrations has seven restorials, that is to say, that the octave consists of seven gravity center sounds, while in the Greek information it was said that the whole octave of vibrations has five restorials, that is to say that the octave consists of five centers of gravity, or five whole notes. And so, only in consequence of the fact that in the presences of your favorites of recent centuries, the functioning of every kind of data for being logical reflection, crystallized in them, began to proceed almost, as it is said there, topsy-turvy. And as both of these entirely differently sourced informations which reached them appeared to them, according to their bobtailed logical mentation, equally plausible, then those beings of contemporary civilization who began in a new fashion to bake, like pancakes, all kinds of separate independent branches of their illustrious science, having fallen during several years into a state of what is called troubled perplexity, could not in any way whatsoever decide which of these two contradictory theories to prefer and which of them to accept and include in the number of branches of their official science. After a great deal of, as they still sometimes say, drying of saliva, they finally decided, in order that no one should be offended, and at the same time in order to have also this branch in their science, to unite into one both of these theories which had reached them from ancient times, and which had nothing in common with each other. And a little later, when one of them, named Guy Doropolo, thought out a very long mathematical explanation of this misunderstanding, namely, why in one theory there is mentioned the division of the octave into seven whole sounds, while in the other into only five whole sounds, and why and how such an important contradiction had occurred, then these mathematical explanations of his entirely pacified all the corresponding representatives of contemporary civilization, so that now, with a quiet conscience, they produce all their wiseacring concerning vibrations on the basis of the mathematical explanations of this obliging Guy Doropolo. In these mathematical explanations, the following considerations were adduced. Now, that is to say, this same obliging Guy Doropolo, in a certain way known to himself, calculated the number of vibrations of all the Chinese seven whole notes, and began to explain that in the Chinese seven-toned octave, those whole notes called Mi and Si are not whole notes at all, but only half notes since the number of vibrations which they have almost coincides with the number of vibrations of those Greek half-notes, which, according to the division of the Greek octave, are found just between the Chinese whole notes Re and Fa, and between Si and Do. He made the further supposition that it was obviously convenient for the Chinese to have the restorial of the voice, that is, the center of gravity of the voice, also on these half notes, and therefore they divided their octave not into five whole notes like the Greeks, but into seven, and so on in this way. 
After this explanation of Mr. Gaitoropolo, as I've already told you, all the other contemporary scientists of new formation were completely pacified, having stuck a label also on this branch of their official science. And now, among them, this branch, under the name of the Theory of the Law of Vibrations, exists there, as our wise teacher Mullah Nazaruddin would say, in clover. About the given case, I still remember, and willy-nilly cannot help expressing aloud, that wise formulation of our always esteemed Mullah Nazaruddin, which expression he has in the following words, Eh, you, corforis tanian pantaloons, isn't it all the same to you whether you have a mule or a hare for your farm work? Haven't both of these animals four legs? These contemporary favorites of yours, of course, do not know, and do not even suspect, that these two independent divisions of the octave into whole notes, which they now have, and which they called the Chinese and the Greek, have as a basis of their arising two entirely different causes. The first, that is, the Chinese division, is, as I already said, the result of the thorough cognizance by the great learned twin brothers, unprecedented on the earth previously, as well as subsequently, of the law of Heptaparapashanoch. And the second, that is the Greek division, was made only on the basis of what is called the restorials of voice, which were in the voices of the beings Greeks of that period, when this five-toned Greek octave was composed. Almost as many of these restorials of the voice, or as they are still sometimes named, light sounds of voice, are formed among your favorites, and until today are still formed, as they are independent groups into which they are divided, and still continue to be divided. And this proceeds so, because these light sounds of voice are in general formed by the beings from many outer as well as inner surrounding conditions not depending on them themselves, as for instance, geographical, hereditary, religious, and even from the quality of nourishment and the quality of reciprocal influences, and so on and so forth. Your contemporary favorites, of course, cannot understand that however hard these same ancient Greeks tried, or, so to say, however conscientious their attitude toward this matter, they could not, with all their wish, find in the division of the octave of sound into definite tones either more or less than these five whole notes, since the totality of all the conditions not depending on them, both inner and outer, gave them the possibility, at the reproduction of their chanting, to rely only on their five restorials of voice. Restorials, or gravity center sounds in the voices of beings, are in general, and are called, those notes which, during the reproductions of different sounds by corresponding organs, the beings manifest according to the properties fixed in them, and depending on the general functioning of their presence, which properties in their turn are the result of heredity and of acquired faculties, freely, easily, and for a long time, without evoking any tension whatsoever on the part of other separate functionings of theirs. That is to say, in other words, the restorials are obtained when the tempo of the result of such a manifestation of theirs fully harmonizes with other functionings of their common presence, the tempo of which is already fixed in them, thanks to all the inner and outer conditions of their common being existence. Thanks to the various conditions there of local character, and also to various assimilated hereditary qualities, various restorials of voice, or gravity center notes, are formed in beings of almost each group, or of each geographical place, and hence the division of the octave into whole notes among beings who breed on each definite part of the surface of this planet of yours 
is quite different. At the present time, among your favorites, such groups exist as have the capacity to reproduce the gravity center notes in the octave of sounds not only in five or seven gravity center sounds, but even in thirteen and seventeen whole notes. To illustrate what I've just said, the beings of a certain smallish group might serve as a good example who dwell on the continent Asia, to whose singing I personally very much like to listen and who, in their physiological possibilities, although they had the data for the manifestation of only three restorials, could nevertheless, in their chanting, reproduce up to forty separate definite sounds. Their chanting was extremely delightful, and at the same time, however lustily they might sing, yet the calm and sustained reproductions of the vibrations of sound were obtained among them only on one or other of these three of their organic restorials. This physiological particularity of theirs, namely that whatever number of definite sounds they reproduced, the beings of this small group always obtained in the whole octave of their voice, only on these three restorials inherent in them, what is called the unchanging totality of vibrations and that all during their manifestation these restorials had the property of evoking what is called centralization and echo in the whole presence of a being. I made very clear to myself when, having become interested in their chanting, I began to investigate this particularity, rare among your contemporary favorites, with the aid of three special what are called their tuning forks which I ordered, and with the aid of several very sensitive what are called vibrometers, which I possessed, and which were invented for me personally by my essence friend Gornohur Harhach. In the Chinese division of the octave into whole notes, this being property was not at all taken into account. The basis of the Chinese subdivision of the octave into seven whole notes as well as the basis of all the information composing the totality of the special branch of knowledge relating to the law of ninefoldness, consisted of the results of those conscious labors and intentional sufferings of the two great twin brothers for which their higher being bodies became beatified, and who now dwell on that holy planet on which we recently had the happiness to be. However it might have been there, my boy, yet at the present time I regret very much that it will be impossible for me with the contemporary sound-producing instrument piano, which I brought from the surface of your planet, to explain fully to you the laws of vibration of all sources which actualize the common cosmic Ansan Baliwazar as this was ideally possible to do on the remarkable Lav Mers Noch, created by the follower of the great twin brothers, himself not less great, also a Chinese learned being, King Tu Toz. On that remarkable elucidatory apparatus, Lav Mers Noch, King Tu Toz arranged and tuned, according to the corresponding calculations made by the great brothers, just as many strings for engendering vibrations as there are consecutive sources in the universe from any planet up to the protocosmos, in the presences of which the vibrations of cosmic substances changing according to law during the trogoauto-egocratic process blend correspondingly for the actualization of everything further. However, my boy, Although the sound-producing instrument piano, which I brought from the surface of your planet, is a very typical invention of your contemporary favorites, yet, owing to the fact, as I've already told you, that the fundamental tuning of the strings of its whole notes and half notes has not yet been changed, therefore, according to the consecutive blending vibrations evoked in a corresponding manner by the strings on it, 
it might still be possible experimentally to demonstrate at least the laws of vibrations issuing from any one fundamental common cosmic octave of substances. That is to say, issuing from one of the seven fundamental totalities of sources. And thanks to this, it might be possible to represent to oneself and to cognize all the reciprocally acting vibrations issuing from all other sources. Because, as I've already told you, all the variously scaled cosmoses, as well as the independent seventh parts of these cosmoses, are almost exactly similar to the megalocosmos. And in each of them, the sevenfold sources of vibrations have the same reciprocal actions as proceed in the megalocosmos. And therefore, having understood the laws of vibrations for any one center of gravity, it is possible to understand approximately also the laws of vibrations for all centers of gravity, if, of course, their differences of scale is taken into account. I repeat, if the strings of this piano are tuned correctly, and the corresponding vibrations are evoked in corresponding strings, then the resulting blending of vibrations almost exactly coincides, even mathematically, with the law-conformable totality of vibrations of substances actualized by corresponding cosmic sources on the basis of the sacred Heptaparapashanach. On this piano, the vibrations of each whole note and half note of any octave pass from one to another exactly according to the law of the sacred Heptaparapashanach, and thus their vibrations, as this occurs always and everywhere in the universe exactly similarly, mutually help each other to evolve or involve. Here, by the way, it will be very interesting to notice that if the calculations and enumerations obtained by these great terrestrial learned beings were almost exact, then they owed it to the fact that the standard unit which they took for their calculations chanced to be that unit which is taken everywhere in the megalocosmos, that is, that same small particle of the most sacred substance, Theomertmologos in which there might still be all the fullness of the power of vivifyingness proper to it. Well, just here I will explain to you, as I promised, about the already mentioned Nereunossian world sound. The Nereunossian world sound is just that sound, the vibrations of which have been taken from ancient times. And even at the present time there is still taken, it is true, for a very small number of your favorites, of course, of this same China, for their sound-producing instruments as the absolute vibrations of the note Do. The history of this constatation of the existence there on your planet of this sound is as follows. It was first discovered by that learned member of the Society Akaldan, which existed on the continent Atlantis who was a progenitor of these same learned twin brothers, and who, do you remember, I have already told you, chanced to meet the first settlers of the country Morao Plessy, and was later elected by them as their chief. At that time, this same learned member of the society Akaldan, during his observations of different cosmic phenomenon which proceeded on and beyond their planet, constated that in a definite locality of a certain part of this country, just near that locality where the town Gob arose, twice a year, after certain meteorological perturbations in the atmosphere, the same definite sound always arose and was heard for a fairly long time. And therefore, he then, on the spot, constructed an elevation such as he required, as is said there, for the observation of heavenly bodies. And he constructed this required elevation on this spot because he wished, during these observations of his, at the same time to observe and investigate also 
this cosmic result, at first entirely incomprehensible to him. And afterwards, when the two great brothers, the later saints, constated and began to investigate the sacred cosmic law of Heptaparapashanoch, as they already had knowledge of this cosmic result, they established themselves in the same place. And it is there that they succeeded in elucidating the character and the nature of this strange sound, which they made the unit of measurement of all their calculations in general. On this piano, vibrations of extraneous origin came through different shocks and tremblings, and for the greater part, from what are called aerial vibrations of inertia, which are generally formed in the atmospheric space by the natural vibrations already referred to. It is necessary at this point, in connection with the actualization of the fifth stopender of the sacred Heptaparapashanoch, to trace a parallel between two processes which externally have nothing in common with one another, namely, in the same manner as the first being food cannot acquire its vivifying power until after its transformation into being Pianjiahari. In the same manner, on this piano, the vibrations of a chord do not acquire a corresponding vivifying power until they have been fused with the preceding vibrations produced starting from the center of gravity of the totality of the vibrations of the note soul. This last particularity of the sacred law of Heptaparapashanoch is absolutely certain in this given case, that is to say, on the piano, but uniquely in consequence of the fact that if the vibration of me and T are produced in a hermetically sealed room, these vibrations either cease instantaneously, or else the notes mi and t, by reason of the momentum obtained from the first shock, given by their arising, undergo involution and immediately cease. That is to say, as soon as the note mi reaches the note do, and the note t, the lower fa. In conclusion, of the explanations that I have already given you relating to the subdivision into seven tones of the octave of sound which exists among your favorites, I must once again, alas, insist on this fact, that if anything has remained and reached them of this knowledge, they have forgotten everything that was essential, and always for the same reason the disappearance from their presences of the practice of actualizing being partic dog duty, the same disappearance which is the very cause of the gradual deterioration in them of the mentation proper to three-brained beings. At this point in his recital, Beelzebub became absorbed once again in his own thoughts, and his look was fixed on the tip of his grandson's nose. There was a rather long silence, after which he said to the latter, Eh, my dear child, I must now speak to you willy-nilly about an experiment of which I was a witness on this same planet Earth, and which refers to the laws of vibrations. I shall, moreover, speak to you about it in all possible detail, for the two following reasons. The first is, because I've already said much to you about this first fundamental sacred law of Heptaparaparshanoch, I would therefore be very distressed if for some reason or other you should not succeed in understanding clearly the particularities of this law. This is why I now find myself constrained to hide nothing from you concerning these experiments, because I am sure that they will enable you to form for yourself an exhaustive representation. And in the second place, I wish to impart to you all possible details concerning these experiments, because the terrestrial being who made them, 
thanks to the knowledge of cosmic vibrations which he had acquired, was the sole and unique being who, during the many centuries that I existed upon the earth, recognized and came to know my true nature.